Hello there and welcome Beam and Dev Livestream BLS 008 and once again with Lars Brink. Lars, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. How, this is a how, great week. I'm both on BLS and CLS this week. There you go. That's awesome. <laughs> when are you going to be on CLS? I think it's Friday. That's very cool. And you know what Friday you're talking about time. already? Uh, I think we'll be going back to um, Dino. Mm, cool. Yeah. And uh, to prepare for that, I went back and updated my Dino CLI guide to support all the options in version 1.4. That's very cool. Did they change a lot of things? Yeah, it's like moving super fast. Uh, I wrote that article was five months ago or so, four months even, and that was version 1.0. Now they're at version 1.4 and they're adding a lot of interesting stuff like uh, running with a watcher so that when you make a change, it uh, restarts your development server like we're used to from Angular, for example. Mm -hmm. Also, Test coverage is now built into the test runner that's, that comes with Dino. And uh, yeah, there was a few um, a few options um, I cool. especially took notice of. So yeah, it's very nice. And uh, well, it's like we like with Angular, right? That you get <laughs> all in one tool, everything yeah. you need. Uh, except with Dino, well, you can't really customize it. It's what you get. I mean, I've... you could use another tool chain for example, the DNON um, uh, tool not, not that used to have the file watcher, and now that's integrated into the Dino CLI itself, but it comes with an, another few options. So it's still a good alternative. Very cool. I think it. Uh, I feel some similarities also with the Go ecosystem, where you get like a formatter and a test runner, et cetera, all built in. Yeah, it, it was born in Go, actually. And then it was changed to use Rust instead. Right. Very cool. Nice, interesting stuff. I haven't played enough with it. I, I downloaded it when it got 1.0. I downloaded it before and I played around with it, but um, still pretty much a node and go at this moment. So cool. Um, last two weeks, we've been talking about NX structuring and well, I learned a ton of things and I'm pretty sure the others as well. And there's actually people uh, saying hi in the chat. Hello to my lovely wife, Derlis, and hello, Oscar, and Bit College. It's Wait good that second. you're here. Yep. Thank you all so much for being here. So uh, today, in today's show, I think for now, this will be the last episode on NPM structure, uh, NX structure. Uh, something really nice got born out of this, and I'm going to promote it. You people that know me know that I'm shameless in terms of promotion, um, which is the NXPM stack. So um, basically, the ideas that Lars got me talking to this make me develop a set of schematics. And when you run these commands down here, you should be able to have a workspace that's very similar to the one we're working with. And... Um, I know that this already saved me a ton of time having this. So for me, basically having a preset that I can just spin up and quickly generate saves me to repeat myself a ton of times, which is always good. And the, the most recent features that I added is end-to-end -end tests for um, the API. So that got in here in 1.6. And I also now add a Prisma library. So Prisma is going to be part of the stack from the start. Also, the idea right now is to start super opinionated, so Angular on the front end and Prisma on the back end. But at some point, I'd love to support more stuff. So if somebody wants to give a go at spinning up an React admin, I'm more than happy to look at how that would look or like a type RM back end. Although I don't really think type RM and NX work well. But yeah, so that's what born with it. That's basically born by these series. And this was also my goal with the series, like um, introduce people, learn new stuff, but also like learn things that, I, that I've been doing in a certain way and get other people's vision on this. Um, so yeah, that's the stack. And today we're going to look at NGRX, our favorite state management, or probably the most popular state management tool in the Angular scene. Um, and then how does that look inside NX? So I'm not sure, maybe Lars, you have something to fill in on this point or comment on? 
or that we just get started straight away? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give the disclaimer that I'm no expert on NGRX. I am using it at work, but I haven't done a whole lot with it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have some opinions, of course, based on my general experience with front end and uh, my whatever <laughs> light uh, hands-on practice I have with, with NGRX and the structure I'm using at work. Right. Have you used any other state management libraries in your front end projects? Service as a subject. Service as a subject. That's the yeah. famous one, right? That's how most people get started, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my me myself, I'm also not an expert on NGRX, and actually, I when it came out, when it first got released, I think it's like that must have been like 2017, something like that. I was intrigued and I was impressed and I wanted to do everything with it. And I tried to, to, to rebuild my whole app into it without any best practices. And it was like a total chaos and it got so much more complicated than my app was before. So that was kind of a tough thing to realize. And um, I basically moved away from it very much. Up until this point, this year, uh, 2020, at the start of the year, I was in NG Alt, uh, the alternative for NG Atlanta. And I got the opportunity to do a course a workshop with Alex Okrushko um, yeah. from the team. And he showed me all the new stuff that was there because I basically, I followed along quite a bit, but I never really used it. But now with all the selectors and the methods that help you create your uh, actions, all of that stuff, I was kind of impressed. And um, yeah, I've been using it a lot more and I like it. So, but my, ma my main, um, that I've been using is service as a subject as well, which is something you can see inside this service. So uh, the pattern, what we're trying to do here is, well, we have a... Maybe you should share a screen. Ha, that should be very... <laughs> That's going to be very helpful. Yeah, there you go. Great. Uh, and then we can already ask Oscar's first uh, question. Are you guys happy with the facade pattern? Lars, what, what is you? your... Yeah. Well, uh, I'll let you go first. Uh, I'm personally a facade person. I'm a fan of it. Mm, I like clean abstractions, I guess. And there's probably people now screaming at the screen, like, oh, you can get clean abstractions the other way as well. Um, but for me, it's more like a logical thing. So when I build out functionality, I generally start with the components, hook it up to some service that takes like dummy data or just do, does something, which often is service in the subject. And once I start building it out, I already have the servers in place. So I'm personally very happy with a pattern like this. How about you, Lars? Yeah, well, I I am uh, using the facade pattern at work. So I'm basically hiding almost everything in GRX behind the facade service. Uh, I'll try to look at it from like both sides of, of this discussion because um, the reason I picked it with my colleague is uh, so that we can hide away that stuff from our components. I really don't want to right. be uh, faking or putting in a test double to replace the store uh, to test a component. Yeah. And um, yeah, because there's a lot of effort, in my opinion, required to set up the tests for using the store with a component. I mean, right. you get the hang of it, but it's a lot to add just for trying to we, put we can say the, the component. We, we can say the forbidden word here. It's a lot of boilerplate you need, right? Oh, to set it all up. don't use the B word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, so, okay, in my, in my situation, yeah, the, other, that's not... uh, the other side of that discussion is I've noticed that you, you'll have a hard time following the best practices of NGRX using the facade pattern. You can't, in particular, you can't do the good action hygiene. Um, right. I know the NGRX team is these days promoting uh, events rather than command action actions. Yeah. And when you do that, you are, you're kind of, you're more giving a context, a context of where that action was created and dispatched from. And you kind of lose that when you use a facade because it can be called from anywhere in your application. That's the whole point of it. Right. Yeah, it, I think 
probably the best answer is it depends. And I think there's situations where either apply. And um, like from my personal point of view, it's very, it, it goes very organic. So I have a set of a, a way of working already. And then for me, if I want to replace my service and subject with an NGRX store or with Akita for that matter, or an NEA, it will happen in the service because like minimal amount of change is required. I think that's testability. Another, yeah, that's a good good uh, point for for this approach as well. Right, like start with what you have. But if you if you will, could design from scratch, so one of the things I realized when doing this whole refactoring of the the API in the structure you suggested, where so before in the in the in the backend I would go GraphQL Resolver to a service to my data layer. So for me that's a clear separation. And if I want to emit or use the same action in my resolver in a REST API, it's simply calling into the same function in the service. So that's all good. Now I'm moving away to having this in their own library. So I have a data access library that exposes the service for me. So I'm moving it basically back into the stack one, one step, if you will. It's moving more towards the background. And then I realized actually my features in the backend, don't, they no longer need any services because that's always going to happen in the data layer. Um, so it's kind of interesting because when I started out, I created them and then I saw my services in the, in the features are actually just one, one tunnel directly to the data layer. So might as well get rid of them. So I also think that's, that's important. Maybe in general, it's a good thing at sometimes like step back and see at what kind of patterns you're making. And if there's layers, you can just cut out because there, there might be. Okay, so cool. Let's let's take a look at the logging component. So um, this is from a sample app. I'll throw it up at the repo at some point. It will be at github.com slash bman. But this is basically what I end up with with my login component. And I'm going to quickly open my register component because it's super simple. So I um, call into a component auth page, pass in a few fields which are different for login register. I pass in a label and I get out the action. This is the same for both. And um, I use Formly for my form, so I don't have to, to create a whole bunch of um, templates. I just pass in like, okay, these are the forms I want to have, and that gives this for me. And then um, this is some leftover to do authentication with a token passed in. Let's not go over that. But this is the actual place where I do my logic. And I call into the, to the auth service, the login method. I pass in the payload and then I subscribe to it. And if I receive any result back, I navigate to the root. So this is my most simple way to basically do a login. And in this component, I don't care. I'm going to be honest with you all. I haven't tested uh, Angular front-end components with this uh, setup and stack in a very long time. Sadly, I'm going to, I'm, I'm more back into it recently, but um, I assume from a testing point of view, this should be fairly straightforward, right? I can provide this admin data access auth service as a mock and have this return anything and that would work, right? Yeah, I mean, so this, based on what I see here, you could test this even without the UI. Right, yeah. So just as an isolated unit test, it creates yeah. the class. So this is already my facade, a facade if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cool. Um, and then when we look, when we look at this uh, service, this is what I was opening when I didn't share my screen a few minutes back. But uh, this is the pretty common pattern, I think. Uh, where you have a behavior subject for both your user object and the token. Uh, this one is useful to use in the communication with your API. And um, I got my login method here, and this is actually where my business logic lives. And actually, if you look at it, it's it's a auto-generated um, GraphQL query, but that's kind of not really relevant for the discussion. So... Nice. Um, yeah, if you have any input or questions, feel free. Yeah, this is bringing back a lot of memories. Uh, this was actually one of the first things I did with Angular. I created libraries uh, that could be, uh, we had our own NPM server mm -hmm. uh, in private, 
and I released a library with a login service and a login form you could put into your, with UI and everything, you could put into your application and hook it up to the backend. It was always the same backend, but uh, we were developing uh, many different Angular apps mm. uh, on top of this backend for different customers. So, <laughs> and cool. I was trying to figure out how in the world I would hook up something like NGRX uh, state, <laughs> like uh, just a small part of state hooked that on up into another app. And I couldn't figure out how, so I went with service as a subject. Yeah, it's probably the most, straight, most straightforward. And um, if it's a few years back, it's also like fully API compatible, right? I think like- Sure, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, well, a few things changed in Angular since then, of course, it was in version five. Yeah, probably um, around um, NGRX, there might've been some changes with the imports and the operators and uh, the lettable operator, the pipes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that happened around the time I I started yeah. working with Angular. But in general, I think this pattern is better, pretty straightforward. And if all you'd ever need was a, a, a login system like this, I would probably still use it this way. Like what I've also learned to, to write my apps to be very portable because uh, oftentimes I want to reuse functionality across apps. It's like you said, like, hey, we have one backend and, and a lot of front ends, but maybe even on a smaller scale where you say, actually my authentication pages is something or my profile page, or uh, maybe the header navigation is something that's very common. And I just like to, to be able to copy paste it. I think this one shines in the fact that you drop this one in you register the service somewhere and it works. You provide it at some point and it works. So that's, it's kind of a plus. Um, with regards to this and to more like data specific, uh, um, data management, state management specific stuff, I really hope to do some more show and tell and actually invite people that work on uh, NGRX, but also NGXS and try to see what it looks like doing the same patterns in various libraries. I have to point something out here. Yeah, go ahead. Storing a full JWT token in local storage is probably a bad idea. Yeah. And what 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 I have a, an issue with this as well. I, I have an issue myself. It's a bad habit I, I inherited some some years ago. But what is your reasoning for calling this out? I like I'm curious to hear. Yeah. Ideally it should never even be accessible in your application. It should be in, for example, an HTTP only uh, cookie so yeah. that the server can read it and your client is forwarding it to the server with each request, but yeah. you're not able to read it. I mean, in the very first uh, handshake where you're uh, authenticating, of course you should get back like user claims and username and, and all of that. Uh, but the actual access token should just be handled by the browser so that you don't have access to it especially don't store it in local storage. It's there in plain text and yeah. any third party code could access that. I think the last thing is the security leak of it, right? So there's a security issue that if you have any, like a plugin that's bad intentional or um, something else running on the same host, same port, or port probably not even same host, then it will be able to access this, uh, this yeah. token. Uh, I'm coming from a practical angle here is uh, I actually tweeted this maybe a month ago, like, hey, I wanted to be able to, to, to communicate on different uh, subdomains. So I want to have auth.example.com and I want to run the app on dashboard.example.com and I want to use the same token. And I started looking at how to do this with tokens and I got rightfully so called out on, on Twitter, like you should not use tokens, you should use cookies for this. And then I got like, oh yeah, this is what we, what we did back in the day. Um, I guess this is the mean, like, should we use cookies always has been the solution, right? It always has been cookies. And, uh, however, though, I think you, you agree. This is what you see in tutorials, right? In tutorials, people are. <laughs> it totally learning. is. And uh, yeah. this is the reason you should not roll your own authentication. You should probably, yeah, if, if you're able to, um, afford it in your project, <laughs> buy something off a vendor. Yeah. Yeah. In general, good advice, but. Yeah, um, it's definitely an interesting thing. So what we can quickly do, 
maybe that might be a good one for now. Um, what I'd like to see, so this is GraphQL Playground. I'm going to uh, zoom it up a notch. And um, so if I do a login here and I input my username, which I think is this, with my super secret password, <laughs> like this, and nice. let's hope that this works. I get back a token. Does this work? No user found. Ah, it's... This is my username. There you go. So this is the token that I get back. And I do this over GraphQL, like the big majority of my app communicates over GraphQL. And I think then if you consider this, um, the security aspect that this is actually already part of the security issue, right? That I just send over the plain token back to the user. And I would much rather have the HTTP server just set the token for me at the, the client requesting this and then go about it. Yeah, so that's definitely something I'm gonna look at and hopefully at some point support in um, in my uh, NXPM stack as well. But yeah, this is, uh, this is definitely a, a point. So that also means that with regards to this state, the only thing you'd ever need your authentication state for is let's keep track of which users logged in. So we can show their avatar and we can show their like in the top level uh, this user is logged in, show maybe their email address or their username. Yeah, I guess there is, there's one more thing to this puzzle of getting the security practices right. Uh, you would usually also receive a refresh token. Yeah. And then we come into the discussion of, well, that one you, you, you definitely need to have <laughs> available so that you can fire it away. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, there might be some other best practices to do that in the right way. Uh, but one aspect you definitely need to consider is how long before it expires. Yeah. Yeah, that's also a very valid thing. And uh, these tokens are actually, they, these are very stateless. So as long as I don't change the secret, this will, uh, this will basically, um, so for those that are not aware how this works in general sense, these tokens are encrypted in such a way that only with the same key you can open it up to verify if the token is actually passed out by the one who claims it is but you can already peek into this right so we can we can go to jot.io jwt.io and, and look into this and um as long as the user id here is the same my api will assume that this one comes from the same person this, in this case, my user ID, this is my user ID. And as long as I authenticate with this server, my backend will assume that you're having this user ID. Is that right? Anything I missed here or I, I skipped over conveniently? It's a lot of details. Uh, it's hard to get all this stuff right. right. <laughs> but in general it. sense, my token, as long as I don't change the backend, this token will give me a valid validation like, hey, I'm you. And there's no way for me in the back end to say like, hey, you cannot um, you cannot authenticate, you cannot do these actions. Hey, yeah. Nacho, good to be here. Nice that you're here. Yeah, let's uh, let's move on. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we have put up a big disclaimer that we're not following best practices. Uh, yeah, so we're doing wide. a lot of yeah, <laughs> doing a lot of stuff that we shouldn't. Um, so, are you familiar with the NGRX generator? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm using one from NX. Okay. Um, because let's, uh, the other thing we could do is using the Narwhal Angular one, which is this one and look at that project. I'm happy to take any at, at this point. Um, I actually haven't tried out the facade flag. So I think what happens with the, um, the NX one is you have to generate your app a, a root state first. This facade basically generates a method and it expo exports it, but it also generates a bit of a different structure. It's basically two schematics into one and the one generates another structure. What, what we might do is just generate two with different name and, and quickly see how they affect each other. But first need to have a root uh, um, 
the root yeah, setup. Right. So I think if looking at this structure that should live here in data access, right? My main data yes. access. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would uh, normally call it the shared data access module. I think that is the right one you're in. I don't have a shared right now, um, but this might be a better place. Let's for now drop it in, in admin and um, yeah. so that we don't have to create a whole lot more data access and then source lib. And then it's admin data access module. And this is where it will be registered. Let's quickly do a dry run to make sure that we are not doing anything strange. Michael is here. Michael Karain from Norway. Hey, Michael. We just got him back from React. Now he's back in Angular. Back in Angular lands. Yeah. Good to have you here. Uh, so admin data access module, comma expected. Oh, yeah, I piece. thought they, um, I actually thought they fixed that because I ran into that problem in a tutorial article I did. Mm -hmm. um, do you know the quick fix? The, okay, so this is the this is the Nawal schematics. Yeah. They fixed Should... it in the um, NGRX schematics. And so you just need to add a comma in that line eighteen of your uh, admin data access module. Okay, after it got generated. Yeah. I can just generate it and add the comma afterwards. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yes. There. Line yeah. 18. Line eighteen. Just a comma. Yep. And that should. Ah, uh, you know what? Actually, ah, uh, yeah. I see what's happening. Uh, what's happening? This goes here. This goes here. I need to make sure my browser doesn't set up. My editor doesn't set up prettier manually anymore. Anything that we can fix. Uh, let's look at this. And it's uh, in the meanwhile, it's installing packages anyway. So we'll, we're busy with that for a second. And then add my our line here. <laughs> Alex uh, is horrified that we're adding the facade flag. Uh, ah. I guess it's only part of the NX, uh, the Nawal's uh, NGRX schematics. <laughs> Yeah, I think Alex is not a big facade-minded person. No, because as I said, it's against the best practices by the NGRX team. Well, as far as I know, and Alex can probably confirm this, I think if you look at the three uh, team members, uh, and, and that would be Brandon, Mike, and Alex, they have three different opinions. And if you would add like Wes Grimes to it, he probably has another opinion altogether, I think. I mean, I, I, I think I, I remember that this is one of the reasons there is not an official style guide because all of the <laughs> core members, they have like their own thing stuff. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to <laughs> say something I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, before Alex joined, I did mention that um, we're not following the practice of uh, creating events rather than commands when we're yeah. using a facade. Yeah. Yeah. So and Alex, the uh, they, have, they are, they agree on facades that they don't okay, like that yeah. much. The whole team. <laughs> so Alex, I'd love to invite you at some point to talk about NGRX in this app or one other show and tell, and we can do your way of doing NGRX and um, I'll happily, um, I'll, I'll, tell what I prefer, because I think it's it's also something that's like, you need to be convinced that it works in such a way and then you understand why. So it looks like we have our roots set up and this was something I actually wanted to prepare already, but uh, okay, so it took a bit longer, but here we are. We have our um, NGRX root set up. It's strict by default and um, it has a basic effect and in dev, in dev mode, we have our dev tools. So. Let's make sure that this one compiles. Go back to the application for a second and make sure that we have the store here in our dev tools, because that's basically a pivotal point. And in the meanwhile, we can quickly go over 
the chat because there's a lot of activity. I really appreciate it. We have like 14 people online. That's awesome. Um, and here is a question from Lothar. Uh, why do you have one lib named just data access and several others auth post profile with more descriptive names? You want to take that, Lars? Yeah, that's what I mentioned that usually I call that one the shared data access because it's the one that is application wide usually. So that's right. where you import that for root uh, module with providers. So you would have this one live in the shared folder and then for the specific app, in this case admin, you would have data access auth, data access post, data access profile. Yeah, even your other folders there, I would have them in subfolders as well, but it depends on the size of your app and the, the way you like to structure your application. Right. I think this is one of my, so I'm the kind of guy, if I learn this, I immediately apply it to my clients if they let me. And I was working with one client on a new app and I told them about the structure. So we have four types of libraries, do it this way. And the guy started spinning up UI libraries and now we have like 25 UI, 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 all underneath each other. Yeah. And he, he asked me, we should have had a subfolder UI, right? And I think... Oh. That is, okay, so UI, just grouping by library type is one way. It's mm -hmm. definitely the least recommendable way of doing it. Okay. You should, never, you should almost never group by type. You should always group by feature or domain or something like that. Right. So rather okay, so it should be, you would have a folder for, say, login or security or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you would have another one for your dashboard and maybe you would have yes. one folder for your user things or maybe that would live with your login whatever way you want to like to group it uh, oscar yeah. is suggesting calling it data access core that's another good name yeah i i thought about that as well personally i uh, it's kind of tempting to pop in a core at anything I do and just start stuffing stuff there. For me, often it's also good to, <laughs> to give it a second thought and like, okay, what if I wouldn't do this in core? Um, because also, honestly, having a lot of stuff in one library eventually might la lead to maybe circular imports that you want to prevent, stuff like this. So, uh, yeah, but these are all great, great questions. And um, I think in general, the the consensus is there's not one right answer. There's there's potential. Yeah. Um, Nacho is also mentioning that we have had a lot of discussions about ways of grouping. So there's many different types of grouping folders in a, an NX style right. workspace. And yeah. uh, he, need, he needs to stop working two jobs so that he can finish that article because I, I refuse to do it uh, without him. So he'll have to do it. So we'll just have to wait. Listen up, Oscar, you have to do it this way. You now heard it officially on BLS, so it's, yeah. It was Nacho, yeah. Uh, Nacho, sorry, Oscar, sorry, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I, I won't mess with this. <laughs> uh, this is in-depth territory. So cool, okay, so we're here, we got our, I needed to do a, oh, a few more you know fixes. What? We have an Angular architect in the house. We have Michael Melkor, and he says, it depends is the right answer. It depends is always the right answer. I think that's the motto for today's episode. BLS 008, it depends, always. But it's true. And um, I think also it's it's the easiest to get compromised between several people. Like first agree on it depends on the situation, not figure out uh, what situation is really about. Yeah. So cool. Uh, I fixed a few errors. I got my API running and we have NGRX, the, the root nice. here. So let's start out. Should we start out with authentication? See if we can get that up and running, get our user information stored here. Or is there any other thing you'd like to start off with? Okay. Uh, another thing, yeah, auth, let's do it. So that means that for auth, we're gonna generate the stuff. So I'm gonna do the same generate, but not the root. So I need to say uh, semicolon ngrx. This is what I'm looking for. And so, yeah, this is the, the line that I've been using. So I I tend to not remind these things. I just depend on my bash history to remind it for me. But here inside 
uh, admin data access lib we generated our we generate we didn't generate anything yet now we just set up the base now inside data access here is where we want to generate the source so i'm going to pull this one off and i'm going to pass in the path of where it is so that's data access off and then it's going to be inside registered inside the admin dash data access auth module this is one of the things of having a generator in a few moments in, a, in maybe a week or something that you don't have to work worry about all of this stuff nice. uh, let's quickly dry run it so my idea is if you want to say hey i want to add an authentication it asks you you want to front end back end do you want to split it up into data access and features do you want to add ngrx state so i probably want to be even more lazy than this this all looks good. And once that's there, we should now have a authentication state. There you go. This looks more like it. Now, this terminal here, um, this is basically your feature site registration and it took a whole lot of opinions about naming stuff. It exported a whole bunch of authentication, um, uh, a whole bunch of NGRX. So the idea is like you directly, you can, it allows you to import selectors or actions from this uh, library right away. And it exports the, which is probably one with, that we should uh, look at using if we want to follow this pattern, right? I have a comment. Yes. This is actually a pretty good use case for the NGRX component store. I've been uh, discussing this a lot with Alex and basically all the things about permissions and, and stuff like that, that could be a good component store. So let's, so if we circle back the app, so my idea was, and it might, what I would love to do is have this data. So I got the, the credentials here, have this stored inside like my store and and reuse that that name so I can use inside the, the top level here, like, hey, you're logged in as B-Man. I mean, Would if you absolutely want to have it in your store and your dev tools, then you you can't use in, uh, Component Store at this point. But basically, Component Store can be provided at the root level or something like that. And it is a facade hmm. in its own way. So Interesting. So the, the public API of a component store is just very similar to a facade. It's a, a bunch of methods and a bunch of observables. Yeah. Interesting. And you can put in there very cohesive uh, effects and pieces of states and updates to that state. So the reason I... Different way. So I've been looking at component store and, and uh, actually during the workshop, Alex already mentioned, so it's cool to see that it really is, is getting out there. And uh, and I, on the ZLS show with Alex, I had the final click where I was like, okay, this is really awesome where they went over the paginator example. Um, for auth, I think, but it also might be very, might be very much my feeling, my gut feeling. I think it makes a lot of sense to have it globally because you like you want to be able to figure out which user am I, at some point, and I'm not sure if the component store could provide that. It, it might be, it might be, yeah. But then it's it sounds or smells al almost like a higher order component or provider in React world, right? Where you have like an overarching. Um, components that you can basically bubble up to and ask or uh, things to do. doesn't have to be tied to a specific component. It's just a service. Ah, and that's, that's another click. I mean, usually in, in many of the use cases for a component store, you would provide it in a component uh, as a component level provider. Mm -hmm. um, that would be in the case that it's tied to the life cycle of a single component, but you can right. just create a component store and provide it in root, for example. And then yeah. you have a singleton service with like, uh, yes, very similar to a service with a subject. So it's actually, so it's sort of like server with subject, but then more official and probably more fancy. Yeah, it takes care of uh, things like race conditions and a lot of these things that can be very hard to debug. Um, right. It works with the three kinds of concepts. Um, a concept for reading state, 
with observables, right? And selectors and a concept of updating state that's called an updater in NGRX and some other libraries also use the name updater. And then you have effects that's the final part you can do. And when those nice. things are tied closely together and you don't have many parts of your state, uh, component store can be a good choice. Um, Very interesting. Have to use that uh, right now, you, you, I guess you can design. No, I, I think it's good to go with uh, the NGRX plane store and, and uh, because I generally like to play around with stuff before I chat about it. So I got some more experience, but it's definitely an interesting point that I didn't really consider. And maybe it's a bit because the name is a bit deceiving. Component yeah, store like, <laughs> provides for component. It's a, it's called yeah. component store, but doesn't have anything to do with the NGRX component package. And it doesn't have anything to do with the store package either. And right. you know what? You don't have to tie it to components. So there's that. <laughs> so Nacho here has an interesting comparison. He says it's foolish, but I think it's not that strange. I like to compare component store with React context. I think this is basically what I also had the, the idea I just had a few moments ago. Like, oh, it's like a provider in React world. But, it's, uh, it's very good for many different things. Uh, you can also use it uh, exclusively for local UI state, which is what Alex did with that example you're, yeah. you were mentioning with the, with the paginator. paginator. Yeah. And you could also use it for a container component service that does all of the server communication and so on without having yeah. NGRX store and, and the NGRX effects package. Very cool. So. Let's so let's stick with plain NGRX for now. And what I generally do when I want to build something with NGRX, I start with making a mental map of the state that I want to have. So in this case, that would be a user and a token. We're, we, let's just store the token for now, even though it's, bad, it's worse practice. We're going to go from, from very bad to a little less bad. Um, so in my case, uh, that would be... Um, I think the state that would show just here, a uh, token, which would be a string, and the user, which would be a user. Now, and it also makes for us a entity state, which I don't think we need, right? We can get rid of the entity stuff for this one. And that gets rid of the selected ID, loaded ID, and error. And this also makes the initial state a bit simpler, where we basically have to provide nothing and this will also get rid of our actions here and this is basically our clean reducer and what i generally do next but if you have if i'm skipping over stuff or like this is uh, you might want to look into this first but this is basically how i go about it and then after that i think about the actions i have so in my case that would be um, so I'm going to rename load here to login. That's what I want to do. And then make sure that I change these ones as well. Uh, login, this triggers the actual login event. If I have a successful login, I get back my user token pair. So, and this is typed, so I can just say pass in my user token, which is exactly the shape of whatever I got back from GraphQL. It's a token, which is string and the user. Um, get rid of these ones. So this is for the login. And then another thing I also like to do is look at my selectors and see what do I, what do I actually want to select. Now and then the, the two main ones here, so I can get rid of all of these for now. Let's get rid of all of those. Main uh, two things I'm interested in getting back is the token and the user, right? So token and get auth user. So I think from a from NGRX, this is this should be sufficient to get working with where we at, and then we can use this get auth user at the place where we want to display, like hey, this is your avatar or something like this. Any comments or ideas so far? No, looks like NGRX store some kind of effects. Ben, okay, so um, let's get rid of this one as well. Now, this is how it was working before. So I have this login method where I call into the API with my username and password. So I guess 
one of the things I just oversaw here is that in my action, I need to pass in props for my login method where I take these. So I take input, which is a login input. And this is something I think is very convenient having this GraphQL generated stuff. You can just reuse these kind of things. And if I ever decide, hey, I want to use it, use with an email address instead of a login, I have to change very little code here. Um, so I basically, from the login page, this is probably the, the good place for now to be in. Here I have my payload, which is this the same has the same shape, login input. Now goes into the login method, and I actually want this to do the login for me using NGRX. So that would mean that here in the component I would inject my facade, right? Facade. Yeah, actually, the the facade service a generator. Uh, I'm interested to see what that looks like. Let's take a quick look. So I already have a few things that don't work. Uh, get out token, get out user. This is what gets um, generated. Let's call this user dollar sign and token dollar sign, and let's get token all auth. Uh, get auth state. So uh, this is this is it, and what. I've, I've played around with it. And what I did was inject the inject this service and then call this this dot dispatch on it. Yeah, I would um I wouldn't have a dispatch. On okay. it. I would just have a method, for example, for login, login take some parameters. Okay, and whatever please. parameters you <laughs> you probably have in your action right now. Yeah. And it was converted to to that action. Basically, uh, and then I can do auth actions here, and here just say auth action login auth, which is a method, and pass in this input, right? Yes. Let's see why? Okay, it expects the word input to be input. I'm fine with that. And get rid of this general one. Okay, so you can do the same for register. Should be, I haven't built the actions. Let's not do register for now. But then this is the only place where we dispatch. Yes. So we don't go dispatching in our own components. That's, no. I'm happy with that. And then let's make sure that in our logging component, we inject this. So I'm going to call this store, I think, for now, state maybe. Start. What, do you, what would you say? This.auth? Uh, yeah, usually I would, yeah, just call it off or, yeah, just off. I'm happy with that. <laughs> now, this is also one of the things that I'm generally messing with. And I, I say messing because I feel like I'm messing around. Like I don't really have a nice way to go about this. So the, the issue with, and probably a lot of people have the same thing. I was used to, to doing a GraphQL call, which basically has to be called. It subscribes and unsubscribes for me, so I can easily set, just subscribe to the thing, and when it's done, go ahead, move on with my life. Yeah. Um, the thing I feel I lost at this moment is my momentum, where I know I'm I'm logged in. I know in the effect it lives, or in the effect there is an auth, an, an an action login auth success that we will trigger at some point. Should I listen to that one here and then do the subscribe based on that? Or would you go all different about it and just forget redirecting in this component and do it at some other place altogether? So you could return an observable from that method, the login method. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually the way I would go around it is having an observable property on the facade that you're subscribing to. And then you yeah. take the first value from that. Yeah. So basically, I mean, insider on on could, init. Could, uh, with that pattern, you could get the problem of correlation. Like, <laughs> is it is it your login uh, that that comes back, or is it some other place in the app that called off yeah. login? Um, so, so it depends. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the right, right, now, 
<laughs> now, right now we could say, uh, subscribe to this one, take one. And then once this is done, basically here in the subscribe block, do my redirect. So Nacho has a good point, that redirect in an effect, not in a component. Yes. Yeah. I think that's that's a very valid point. And I think actually that might be the, the good, the best way to handle about it. And, and this probably goes very much in line if you decide, OK, this is an event, because then I would say login page login if I would have multiple places where I could log in. And this would all make more sense that way, because we know that hey, this login event came from this part. So then you want to redirect here. Um, without losing too much functionality, I think this works for us. And now we trigger this login method. So we can go uh, here in the login page, oh, here in the login page. And then when it's redirecting already, it's too eager. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of this for a second. So I'll go to the login page here, and this should trigger an action. So I'll take any credentials up here, and there you go. We have our login auth. It's an action, and we send in my credentials here. So then the next thing we want to do is go to our effect. And... Uh, Let's see, uh, this is, um, I think from a an convention point of view, it's the name of your action with a dollar sign. This create action. And now I'm basically lost. Help me out, please. What, what is the next? Uh, do you know, or, or I'm happy to also generate something if that's easier, but yeah, I'm also. You need to, um... You need to pass in a, a Lambda function, and the parameter is an action stream. Is it this one? I think. Or, yeah, how is it? Yeah, that's I the, think, yeah, the, let the me, reason we have generators for this. Yeah, and this <clears> is the reason I'm I have. B word. <laughs> this is the reason I have WebStorm, yeah. because you have like. Local history, yay. Okay, this is what gets generated. So we can say uh, login auth is the action stream of type. And the off type is login auth. And this will either go a login auth success or login auth failure. And this is something I realized um, is, I think, added by NGRX. I'm not sure, uh, by Narwhal. I'm not sure if NGRX does it the same no. way doesn't no. do the same way. It doesn't have this fetch operator. It's also coming from Narwhal Angular. Um, but this generates the user token. So what I can do here is actually call in, and let's just pass in the SDK straight away. So I'm going to say SDK is my Apollo Angular SDK. So this is whatever got generated by GraphQL, Apollo Angular SDK. There we go. And here I can just call this.login. So I would say this.sdk.login, get my data in here, and the data is actually action.input. Then I don't need to subscribe. I need to pipe through this, right? And then in a map, taking whatever results I have, return this here as rest.data.login. This should validate, right? There you go. So cool. So this does uh, the login for me. So if we if we go back here, yeah, it should work. I think this should actually return a token. Um, let me. There you go. Login of success. Nice. And here we have token and the stuff starts. Um, and then one of the things I generally start out with once I do this stuff is hydrating. Is this something you do or you, uh, you okay. advise against? I'm, 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 so one of the things I did 
in the service I had was stored in local storage. Yeah. Uh, like there's the, the, the probably the, the most straightforward reason to do it is I don't have to log in again each time I refresh the patch, right? So it keeps my credentials. Um, is there anything in NGRX that you do or 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 just don't do re with regards to these things? Because one I of the things I use is hydrated. I haven't gotten that far yet with NGRX. <laughs> okay, yeah, no worries. So yeah, how so, would you do it? Uh, so there's a, a library and I'm not sure if I have it uh, close. I think I can quickly check it out. I mean, uh, local storage is synchronous, so you could even have it in the initial state. Right. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I think, let me quickly search for hydrate inside other projects, kickstart, kickstart lips, admin. Um, yeah, I think I'm using a third party library that just, it's called NGRX. Might even be from a Danish guy if I'm looking at his name. Lars Kam. What? It's not you, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, highly configurable state syncing between NGRX store and local storage or session storage. Okay. And uh, this is what I've been using in order to keep everything. So what I did is similarly to here, I've included this and basically you say, hey, this, this key in your state, use this way to store it. Okay. Or this key and then exclude the other keys. And this has been pretty nice because I don't manually need to do it inside um, local storage anymore. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the things um, I've been using here as well. And Nacho says it depends. Yeah, I guess this also depends. They uh, are discussing where to do the redirect. <laughs> sorry? They are discussing where to do the redirect. That's ah, what okay. Exactly. This is what depends. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I already agree. Um yeah, so this is the this is the login off. I think it's it's pretty straightforward actually what we've done here. And and this is plain NGRX. One of the one of the more pressing questions I have in my personal, in one of my personal projects, right? I got a, a, a project entity and projects is um, one user can have multiple projects. You can see it like a GitHub repo, for instance. And inside the project, you have a ton of things happening. So my initial thought was, let's create a projects um, state. Let's create a library like this on projects and do the whole uh, entity, NGRX entity with projects, but then, and that works for listing the projects, searching them, et cetera, et cetera. That's all fine. But then in the project detail page, I started with using the same one and then it starts to get messy because now I'm managing my list of projects in the same state, in the actual, in the actual same slice as the individual projects. Do you have any opinion on this or any thoughts around this? Yeah, you're putting it in a separate feature store, right? Yeah. Well, I sh that's what I should do. So what I did before was in the same feature store. And and I think the question is, is it what would you suggest breaking it up? Like having one store for the list and one store for the individual project? Uh, yeah, this is where I'm on the deep end of the water. I don't have to have my experience. Okay. I don't know what the best practice in in um, dividing your stores. Uh, what was the first one that's not about projects? Um, no, I had um, I had the project list, which is the uh, NGRX entity uh, store, which is super oh. convenient and it allows you to, to do a lot of things on entities without refreshing the data all the time. Like filtering it out. I don't something. even know how to use entities because I I work in I work with time series. There's no entities. Ah, so. okay, cool. Yeah. But I I think if anything if anything is my lesson of this uh uh this three part uh, the trilogy on show and tell with Lars is that splitting up is good and 
that's I've learned a ton more of things, but uh, in general, I think that's it. And um, I will definitely go ahead with with trying this. Uh, and also for feature show and tell. So the idea is uh, I got to invite more people. Not sure if Alex now said yes, he, he had to run, but I'll, I'll ask Alex. And uh, uh, knowing Alex, he's probably interested in, in sharing what he knows. Definitely. Um, and I'll prepare an app similar to this with an exact use case where I'm like, okay, this is starting to get messy. Um, but yeah, I think this is, uh, this is a super powerful um, structure in general. I really, really like the idea of splitting it up. And uh, maybe to finalize, we can quickly go over the API structure, see how I, I did it with the same knowledge and how I applied it. Yeah, I, I would be very interested to see that because I think you did feature libraries in the API as well. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so this is in a few in a few in a few ways it's a bit different than the um, admin front end. Um, I think one of the main differences is like in the API, you don't have the concept of a shell. Well, neither do you have like UI. So it's, it's, you have a different set of libraries, but also you don't have routes in a nest API. Well, you do have routes, but it's not uh, the way to tie all the modules together. So we don't lazy load our routes in. And also it's not really relevant if you load in a ton of data, you can easily load in your whole API on runtime on start time. It gives you a little bit of a penalty on the start, but you don't have to lazy load. So this is why in this in this instance, I still have a pretty fat app module, um, but it only lo loads in features. So this was kind of where I got to like, okay, my app, my API only loads features. And then in my API core module, this is where I do the heavy lifting. Um, for That's instance- the, uh, the technology used for this API. Oscar, yes, uh, API is Nest.js. So this is all the, the Pang stack, Prisma, Angular, Nest, NX, and GraphQL. And, um, but this should work fairly similar if you have like an Apollo GraphQL or uh, GraphQL modules or something like this. Um, so then in Lips API, I have a feature core and this is where I tie together, uh, for example, I define my configuration I install my GraphQL module. This yeah. is some third-party GraphQL. And um, the actual functionality lives outside. So let's have a look at authentication, for instance, which is generally an interesting one. Now, what I didn't do here, and this is something I definitely plan on implementing, I want to start making data access auth here and having a specific data access library because right now, this is what I suggested. This is my resolver. So these are my GraphQL queries. For instance, get your, your own user account. So this is this all works with decorators and it gives you decorators to compose your API. And this is the login mutation, the one we just looked at. And then what I do, here, I, this has been a pattern I've been following for years. Now my resolvers are super tiny. And all they do is wrap into a method, uh, wrap into a uh, call into a service into a yeah. method that has the same name. And this is really helpful if you want to do like REST or you need to have a service calling these functionalities, you can easily do this. Yeah, I, I actually have a similar structure. Um, I've been doing a, some very light uh, NestJS APIs that I use to replace the backend in end to end tests. Mm -hmm. Or rather, I replace our microservices. Uh, so I ha do I actually have a backend that's a so-called API gateway? But right. then I replace the actual microservices that the backend is communicating with. I replace them using just uh, some very simple Nest JS APIs, and I instrument them so that I can s set up the state they're in and reset very it cool. between certain cases. So very the structure cool. I came up with there is very similar to this one. I'm not using GraphQL, but so I'm just using controllers. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, yeah, so that's why I thought it was interesting you did features um, because the kind of layers or types of concerns that I identified in my simple Nest API was uh, web, where the controllers would live. 
and application where those services that you list here right. would, and then a data where I would have my, um, it was an in-memory database, but it will still live in, in a data part. Yeah. So that's very but, interesting. You have a similar that, structure here. That kind of sounds like it's more of a division on file type, right? Where you have like a bunch of controllers in one folder. And no, then... no, 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 <laughs> one okay. per part of the app. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I would have a, uh, whatever project and inside yeah. I would have a grouping folder called project. And inside right. of that, I would have a web folder with the uh, controllers or GraphQL, whatever, and an application folder where I would have these services and right. a data folder where I would have the, uh, whatever, uh, data technology you're using. So if we quickly go over it, because it help, it often helps to, to visualize this. So you would have libs and then you would have like API. Yes. And then that's the app. And then inside here, you would have web. No, I would have a grouping folder before that. Project web. Again, I don't group by type first. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's usually, I mean, if, if you're build, unless you're building a very small project, but. Right. Let's say we're going to talk about like cars, whatever car here, car feature. Yep. And then one called application as well, I've heard. Inside the inside these folders, uh, yeah, project slash application car slash application. Yeah, that's where those those uh, domain services would live. Yeah, I think also having this um, in between might make sense for this structure. And um, before talking to you about this, I was already uh, moving to a structure similar to this, but then leaving out the main app. So let's add admin back to it, because if you do it this way, you could have something similar with admin, right? Where you say yes. project access and then feature, maybe pages, yep. whatever. Yes. No. <laughs> oh. Pages. No, no, no. Oh, not that again. Feature project. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't put, don't create a folder called. Pages is type, yeah. I hear page you. I hear you. Should uh, you should usually have one per page, one library per page, or something like that? Yeah. Even more granular in some cases. That can also be put on a T-shirt. One library per page. One yeah. one component per module. Yeah. Just one. Yes. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Get granular. Yep. Cool. Okay. So um, yeah, let's let's. Um, quickly look at this structure. So the core library is where I load in a bunch of stuff. It should probably get smaller at some point. Um, and then I think, uh, like comment is, is a good one. Yeah. So, um, this is the public API for comments. So we want to have like, a, um, a list of comments, but only we're never going to list comments individually. It's always going to be in the context of a post. Okay. This is where I, this is, I think the, the, a good way to define your public API. The same goes for creating a comment. You need to know on what, which post you are creating it. So these are kind of specific things. I thought about auto-generating a bunch of this, but I come more to the conclusion they're very similar, but they're not, um, they're not similar enough that you can just create them automatically. So it's probably good to give it some thought. So there is a, a funny question. <laughs> this one. Yeah. How many, How many lines? Up in, yeah. in, in my work project must be hundreds. So it's still early on in that project. We have just three pages in Angular with very few features on each. Uh, but I think we have 50 or 60 libraries at this point. That's including the Nest.js stuff as well. And, but uh, yeah, that's for a single gonna... app. I'm going to quickly open a project that I'm working on. And this is, uh, this is not following best practices. So bear with me. I'm, this is like where I'm, this is my experimental app. So it's, I'm actually between two structures. I'm going to slide this in here. Um, but if you look at the um, annex JSON file here, and I think if we do a search for tags and then oh. this thing, we see that I have, uh, 27 
72 nice. libraries here. Proud. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, this is already good. What you're not going to be proud about is like naming and structuring. So here, what I did, I, I started with apps, admin and API and started structuring it. Mm. But things got unwieldy from here. And, and But also to experiment, right? This is not a production level app. This is my playground. It's my big monolith playground. One of the things I did here for, uh, where did I do that? Yeah, I think CMS. Actually, CMS doesn't have a backend. Here, pages, there you go. First error already. Um, but what I figured would be good, and I, I, but I don't think, like after what I've learned right now, here you go, this is a great example. So here I started with integration, and I was like, okay, but integration is my feature, and I wanna have API functionality and web functionality, like front end. So here my back end, and then I start with data. So this is something I would do very similarly, although yeah. I'd call it differently. But I had a... This is, um, yeah, so it's interesting that you do the feature split first and then you put in the app part and the API part. Yeah. That's definitely also a, a good way to do it. I mean, in our project, we have a .NET backend. So it's in... It it's lives outside end. of the the NX workspace right now, yeah. but we're they're in the same repo and we're always working on the backend part and the front end part at the same time. So this actually makes sense if you're able to do it that way. I I really like the idea specifically from the promise I gave myself. Oh, I should be able to pick this up and move it to a new app very quickly. Yeah. And um, but I'm pretty sure that once I got my NXPM stack worked out and it works well, I can easily start creating variations because that's basically passing in different directory names and you should be good. So it's definitely something I hope to explore in the future. Um, yeah, this works. What doesn't work, and this is my advice, probably advice, don't do this in one repo where you, where you have like two structures because I'm currently all over the place. And if I need to change like something for the CMS, I'm like, ah, CMS is here, yes, but the back end of the CMS, Still lives in API and it doesn't live in CMS, it lives in content. Yeah. And this is one of the things I had before where I just, I would not make a lot of different features and my content actually, now I have a content block and I have content site and content page. This is not scalable. This is just getting super messy. At first it works and then at some point it's like, why do I have all this, what, these things? Uh, and I also do another thing that I shouldn't is Group it by file type. Yeah, now you're grouping by type. Yeah. <laughs> but then, okay, so yeah, this is this is one of the things that I've been working with. Well, and this is frankly also one of the reasons why I, I like to have these discussions in the first place. Like, hey, people have figured this stuff out or have an opinion about this. Yeah. Um, yeah but in general, um, there are several ways to go about it. There's there's probably several ways that work well, and there's a whole lot of things that don't work well. And uh, yeah. I think the reason, if, if... the reason you don't do that group by feature, uh, or sorry, group by type only, is because to work on one piece of functionality, now you have to navigate to the models, the controllers, the views, or whatever type you have, instead yeah. of just going into the courses or projects folder and then working your way down from there and, yeah. and staying within that zone. So yeah. it's about having the things that uh, change at the same pace, having them live close together. Yeah. And also makes it easier for several teams to work on the same project. They can yeah. feel confident that they're not changing um, or when they are changing stuff that affects someone else, it's uh, not by coincidence, it's <laughs> intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that that definitely, if you're in a bigger team, it's definitely interesting that you're aware, like, hey, if I'm, as long as I stick in this folder building out this feature, I won't step on their toes. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Basically, you just have to be concerned about the public API of certain libraries, but right. you don't change that by accident. You do that very intentionally. So one of the things I did here when I when it was all features uh, add the models here. So now these models now make way more sense inside data access. 
Uh, this is also good for cross importing them. So as long as you don't circularly import them, you can freely import any model from any other model to define them as a relationship or something, which I think is powerful. Um, but then another question, how about DTOs, data transfer objects? Uh, also data access, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, the models there, I mean, if they're used in many places of the app, they should probably live in a domain type library or a types type library or something like that, whatever you want to call them, so that basically any library type is allowed to import from that and you don't get the circular dependencies. Yeah. So not even call it data access, but just have like a domain. Yeah, just for those types. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, that makes a and lot of sense. Data transfer objects, you're right, they they should live in the place where they are being used. So that is the data access library. Oh, well, actually, case. these are being used in the resolvers. Oh, okay. So here we say like, hey, your login takes this shape, yeah. this DTO is your input. Yeah. So they live next to the to where I use them. Okay, so I would have them in the web uh, yeah. library with the resolvers. Yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, and then I think there's always stuff like decorators. Hey, decorator to get your user off of the Express session or your web session. These are probably... What is a decorator <laughs> in NestJS? Uh, Sorry? Uh, it, um, these are just custom written decorators. So I can use this in my... Decorator is in NestJS. Uh, well, this here's the example, right? So, or is that not the question? I just haven't seen them. Is is it a NestJS thing, or is it just a yeah, JavaScript yeah, yeah. decorator in general? Or this is a uh, per, um, so this is a NestJS uh, helper method that allows us to create this um, context decorator. Okay. And what I actually do here. I don't fully understand how exactly um, why this is needed, but as far as I understand it, your GraphQL request comes in through Express, right? It's just a, an Express HTTP goal. And at some point, and this is where this execution context, there is a context created for the, ex, the, the actual GraphQL part of the request. So you go, you take the, the request that comes in and you make it available to GraphQL. And this REQ, but I, I'm probably bad at explaining it. I, I honestly don't really understand what exactly is going on behind here. I'm also not the type of guy that, pers that, that really cares. Like when this works and it gives me what I need, I'm generally happy. So sure. But this is okay. your HTTP request and we take the user off of this. So this is our way to decorate methods that you want to get access to the user. For instance, to verify like, hey, can this person do this actual operation? Okay. I hadn't seen that before. I've used pipes, NestJS pipes. Right, yeah. Forming input to a certain type. Yeah. These are also, I think, I'm not even sure if I'm using them here. I decorate these with the is not empty and minimum length decorator, and this needs this validation pipe to work. Okay. Um, but I don't think I actually run them here in the resolvers. I don't. Nice. So... Lars, thank you so much for being here again. It was a really, really awesome session again. Um, I think for now, we had some great, great insights on uh, doing NX and doing, doing related stuff. Everything is available on uh, YouTube. I just today uploaded the last, uh, last week's video. I'll hope to upload this one, upload this one tomorrow. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. I hope to invite you at some other point uh, for another topic. Uh, I think you have a lot of interesting things to talk about and you definitely have a strong opinion and you like to share it, which is something <laughs> I appreciate. There, so, I have a question for you before I leave. Sure. Uh, I'm interested in your family name, how you pronounce it in Dutch. Borgleven. Yeah, because I think it sounds very similar in Danish. What does it mean in Dutch? Um, it doesn't really have a name in, in modern day Dutch, but okay. uh, it comes from German. And um, uh, 
Borgreven is in German, as long, uh, is, uh, I have to believe my dad, uh, Borgraf, and Graf, I don't even know how to say it in, 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 okay. in English. I should definitely look it up. But in... in, in Castle Count. Yeah. Count, uh, Count Dracula. Yeah. Yep, it's exactly the same. Okay. It would be exact. And how would you pronounce it in Danish? Borgreve. If you could make the G a more yeah. like the Spanish Gota, then, then you're there. Borgreve. But it's terrible. And actually, when I was a kid, I was really sad that I have did not have an international name because I would know like a guy that was called Mike. And I was like, this name is at least like international. And I was Bram Borgleven. It's like, can't yeah, get any more Dutch. It would be something like Borgreve. Something yeah, in like English. A... Yeah, it's generally Borgreve. And that's also how Google Translate translates it. So, and, um, but I don't really worry if people buy my name. I mean, I get it. And, um, uh, but my wife is uh, still having issues pronouncing it well, and uh, <laughs> luckily she won't she won't take over my name, so she doesn't have that hurdle. I might take a Colombian name at some point. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, cool, man. Thanks so much for being here, and uh, I hope to have you on any other time on BLS. Yeah, just reach out. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Perfect. Uh, same. Uh, and thank you everybody else for watching. That's all we have today. And I hope to see you in the next. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.